Hello, I'm Rachel Babin from Oncology News Australia, proud producers of the Oncology Journal Club podcast. Join Eva Segaloff, Craig Underhill and Hans Prennan as they chat through the latest papers. How safe is HRT for breast cancer survivors? In today's episode, the team talk us through the nuances of HRT as well as dendritic cells, circulating tumour DNA, postpartum breast cancer and much more. In our The Paper That Changed My Practice segment, you'll hear from our dear friend Jeremy Shapiro and learn all about the Kaboom Regimen. And don't miss the amazing paper of the week, which asks, does scalp calling have the same efficacy in black patients receiving chemotherapy for breast cancer? You'll find links to all of the papers, bios and Twitter handles in the notes on our website. So join us for the most relaxed oncology education podcast. Reach out to us on Twitter using hashtag OJC. For regular news and podcast updates, subscribe to the Oncology Newsletter on oncologynews.com.au. It's free and it's a great way to support the OJC. This is Rachel Babin and this is the Oncology Podcast. G'day, g'day, g'day. Hey, Hans, tell us your secret. My secret is that I got my third vaccine yesterday. Oh, and it's great. Too, it's very, very painful in my, so, arm, my arm. I didn't get sick, so that's a good thing. Eva, he was, I, he, you, I came on before you and I said, how are you, Hans? He goes, oh, my arm, it's so sore. Oh. <laughs> he saw hands so is it, is it a male thing or a Belgian thing or is it the combination? We were having a boys' whinge about. Oh, boys' whinge. Come on, tell us some oncology. Snappy. This one is a snappy episode. What have you got, Hans, for us? So I will start with my main article. It's already difficult to pronounce it, but I will still try it. It's called Dendritic Cell Positive in Mismatch Repair Proficient Colorectal Cancer Liver Metastasis Limits Immune Checkpoint Blockade Efficacy. Quite a long title. I selected this one because it's a publication from Rakesh Jain. I don't know if you remember him, but he's yeah. quite famous in the field of the angiogenesis. And it's, this one is published in PNAS USA. And... I don't think I have to say that MSS, metastatic colon cancer in general, don't respond to immune therapy. And the guy, he focused on actually mouse models, and he made mouse models with an orthotopic MSS, colon cancer, liver metastasis. So this means that you inject tumor cells within the liver. And he did the same subcutaneously, like we use a lot of mouse models where you use a subcute model. Also, MSS, colon cancer, metastasis. And what he saw is that if you use subcutaneous model, then this one is actually not sensitive to immune therapy like we see in humans. But when you inject them in the liver, then they are often sensitive to immune therapy. So they compared this microenvironment in both models, so the orthotopic versus the subcute, and they saw, in general, there were less activated T cells, less dendritic cells in the IO-treated orthotopic liver meds. And so the idea was, okay, maybe if we inject FLIT3 ligand, so FLIT3 ligand activates dendritic cells, you get more activity of immune therapy. So I think two main messages in this article that we should use orthotopic rather than subcute models. And you know, a lot of the data that we use to go into trials is with, with subcute models, but maybe orthotopic are much better. And they show that also, but this is more theoretically, that dendritic cells can also increase the efficacy of immune therapy. But this is also, I think, it's not a surprise. Yeah, dendritic cells sort of the quiet achiever of the immune system, aren't they? We tend to forget about them, but they're probably critically important. Mm, excellent. Very good. Thank you, Hans. Yep. Okay, Craig, what have you got? I've got a paper from the JCO, so a bit more mainstream, and this is early onset colorectal adenocarcinoma in the ID database, treatment adherence, toxicities and outcomes with three and six months of adjuvant fluoro pimidine and oxaliplatin. 
So, you know, I hesitate to present this to esteemed GI experts, but he goes. So we know that early onset colorectal cancer is increasing. And so in this paper, they define that as patients less than 50. So I'm not sure if that's the standard definition. Yep. Yeah. And so that's, you know, relatively rare. So in this idea database of 16,000 patients, 1,500 or 9.6 had the early onset colorectal cancer. So they tended to have a a statistically significant better performance score, similar T-stage, higher N2. They were more likely to complete planned treatment duration and they received a higher treatment dose intensity, especially with the six-month regimens because they were able to stay on treatment longer. So interestingly, GI toxicity was more common in the younger patients, but hematological toxicity was more frequent in the late onset, which you'd probably expect. But compared with the late onset, there was worsening cancer-specific outcomes, especially in the high-risk stage three, which had lower, there was a lower three-year relapse risk survival, 54% versus 65%, hazard ratios 1.33 and a higher five-year cancer-specific mortality rate, 24% versus 20%, the hazard ratio 1.21. There was no difference observed with the three- or six-month therapy with equally poor disease-free survival rate. So young age is negative prognostically. I know often in our MDTs we say, oh, you know, we talk about the three months versus six months, and we talk about you know, oh, they're young, we probably should give them six months. But this paper would argue against that. So, you know, there's probably some confounding issues in this kind of analysis. So in this, there was no difference observed with three or six months of therapy, equally poor disease-free survival rates. So the conclusion was that young age is negative prognostically in high risk stage three colorectal cancer associated with significantly higher relapse rate. And despite the better treatment adherence and higher administered treatment intensity, there was no difference in that three versus six months chemotherapy. So I'm not sure if this was a pre-planned analysis or whether, you know, this is an ad hoc analysis. So that's probably one of the weaknesses of this paper. But interesting. We know young patients come up in our MDT and often there's a tendency for people to argue about longer therapy rather than shorter because of their age, but this paper would argue against that, possibly not definitively, but I'll now defer to, I'm only an ASPRO, so I'm going to ask the professors what they think. Well, I know this paper and I know Eliza who wrote it. She used to be a soccer player. You'd love her. I mean, on her Twitter she says ex soccer ex footballer now now oncologist so this is the idea meta analysis so it's all the 3 verse 6 month trials that made up the idea so we did the scott trial as you know in australia and then there was the french study uh, there's gr- uh, a greek study there are a number of different trials all looking at at this duration question and they had a a number of planned analyses i don't know when this was uh planned but i think it's it's very valid the 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 problem is they don't have they don't know who is lynch and who isn't lynch so that may be a factor but what really struck me out of this is the really we still have poor outcomes for these people and this is the best of the best clinical trial population and your 3 year dfs is still not great for for any of the groups so there's a there's a long way to go what did you make of it professor prennan actually it's it's a bit boring that i will say this but we need more biomarkers to tell us which ones need to be treated for how may, for how long with which treatment. So that's why I will come back in a minute with one of my short bites about circulating tumor DNA. I think this is the way to go in the, the near future. It's a boring paper or it's a boring comment to say we need better biomarkers? Or it's a boring review by Craig. <laughs> yes, because everybody always says this, we need more or we need to validate this data, we need more biomarkers, we need to confirm in a bigger trial. So these are boring remarks. 
It's quite sobering, isn't it? So we do need to do more work to really understand why they do worsen. Of course, we we treat a lot of people who don't need treatment either because they were never going to relapse or they're going to relapse anyway. And six months of Oxali gives, you know, problems for life with neuropathy for many patients. So, Eva, in what field did you select your main paper? Was ah, it GI, breast cancer? It was breast cancer. Well done. Why do you Why do you always select breast cancer? Papers? Ah, because it's uh, actually a very you common cancer, GI. hands, <laughs> and I know I can't do GI. No, I'll tell you why I selected this paper, because my husband, David, who's an endocrinologist, had a patient who has terrible, terrible, terrible menopausal symptoms and had breast cancer in the past. And he said to me, you know, she would rather go on HRT and accept a risk of the breast cancer recurring, you know, but what is that risk? And so we all looked at this some years ago when some primary trial data came out, but very recently in November in breast cancer research treatment, a meta-analysis came out. So these were four randomised trials that were included, 4,050 patients, about half got HRT. Some of them got an oestrogen-progesterone combination, but one of the trials was on Tibolone. And I actually remember this because it was going to be the great saviour because it's a non-oestrogen. So this was thought that this would solve the problem. Two of the studies were in sweet yeah, were Swedish. Now they were all published a long time ago, 2002, 2008, 2009, 2013. So we haven't made any progress in this issue since then. And it's a huge issue for survivorship and quality of life. There was one study that only enrolled hormone receptor negative breast cancers and the other were either hormone positive or hormone negative. The meta-analysis unfortunately confirms that the hazard ratio for breast cancer recurrence for hormone for HRT compared to placebo, the hazard ratio is 1.46 with the 95% CIs 1.12 to 1.91, highly statistically significant. Now, interestingly, if you do a subgroup analysis, those with hormone receptor negative tumors, there was no increase. How and their their studies were meta-analysis was good, the heterogeneity between studies was low, there was no publication bias. It wasn't an individual patient data. So unfortunately, the hormone receptor negative patients get wrapped up with the overall results, which is, sorry, you can't have HRT. And I really think we should do more trials in the hormone receptor negative patients or do an individual patient data meta-analysis that might help us. So why did the Tibolone trial show increase in breast cancer occurrence? That was a real surprise. And it's going to be something to do with the estrogenic effect exerted by Tibolone. This is the author's proposal on micrometastasis in tissues. If you already have depleted tissues of oestrogen by AIs, maybe they're more sensitive to even a little bit of stimulus. But so I had to say, unfortunately, the data is still the same, but but we should do more trials, I think, in hormone receptor negative patients. So given our recent discussion on the podcast about the levels of oestrogen receptor positivity, if you're designing a study in hormone receptor negative women, would you make it 10% or 1%? Oh, that is an excellent throwback to episode. I thought you were going to say that's an excellent question. No, it is an excellent <laughs> no, question no, no, and no. an excellent <laughs> a throwback to promote our previous podcast, whatever it was. You'll have to listen to them all to find it. No, I think you've got to make it less than 10% based on our paper we presented before, not less than 1%. Mm, interesting. interesting. But this is a really everyday in the clinic question. So I think that's going to be of interest to a lot of people on the podcast. 
Look, the problem is that unless you live through the symptoms, you don't realise how debilitating it is and it can sound very minor. But for some, even women who have mild menopause don't like it, mild flushing. But for those who have severe and long standing, it has huge impact on quality of life. So we need to do more studies. Nothing's been done in this field uh, or published uh, recently as far as uh, I'm aware. But if you're a listener and you know something we've missed out, send it in to us. All righty. So, Hans, you have four short bites. <laughs> I selected two already. So one I already suggested. It's a study from Pierre Laurent Puy, as you know, works in Paris and has done a lot on circulating tumor DNA. And this is not really novel, but I just want to highlight that there is a lot of published data about this. He published about circulating tumor DNA as a prognostic marker in stage 2 and 3 colon cancer. And why is it important? Because they clearly show that the presence of ctDNA before surgery is a prognostic marker. So if you can detect it, it's a marker of recurrence. But it's also a good marker for minimal residual disease after surgery. So I still wonder, everybody's publishing this data. It's quite yes, similar in all the trials, but still we're not using this. So I hope soon that maybe a commercial kit will come out that we can use it in daily clinical practice and also will guide us which patients we need to treat with, with adjuvant treatment. So, it, you know, the kits to have different levels of sensitivity. They have, you know, the gold standard is the beaming, very deeply sensitive with paired tumour sample that's slow. So I think there's going to be a lot of work on this and watch out for a publication about the ASCOLT trial MRD Ooh. Ooh, CTDNA study. Mm. Mm. Very Sweet curious. Yeah. <laughs> so the second one I selected, it's about breast cancer. And it's called... Where? It's what's in, that? It's published in Nature Communications, November 2021. It's called postpartum breast cancer has a distinct molecular profile. I found it quite interesting because, you know, I don't have to tell you that young women with breast cancer has often a poor prognosis and there is some interaction with parity. That's something we know. And how do you define postpartum breast cancer as it that's, that's breast cancer within five to 10 years after childbirth? And this has a poor prognosis if you compare to age stage and biological subtype matched nulli paris patients. So once they got children, it's different than if they don't get children, just to summarize it. And this study evaluated possible genomic differences explaining this poor prognosis. And actually, I will not go into detail because it's a short bite, but they found biological differences proving that this is a unique entity within young women breast cancer. So you don't get children. That sounds a bit sus. You have children. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, yeah, I actually picked that paper to do for the next episode. So well done. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. We we don't tend to think of it as postpartum breast cancer if it's that, you know, five years post. Partum. We think yeah, of indeed. it as very yeah, immediately postpartum, but we should actually think more about that definition, shouldn't we, and pay attention. Mm. Thank you, Hans. Craig, what have you got? I've got two quick bites, Eva. First one, International Medullary Thyroid Carcinoma Grading System, a validated grading system for medullary thyroid carcinoma, which, of course, is an aggressive neuroendocrine tumour. There's been no, unlike other neuroendocrine tumours, there's been no classification system. So this was a paper that came up with basically high grade and low grade, so quite easy based on, this was a study done in the US, Europe and Australia uh, in some centres from Sydney. So they looked at three tissue from 327 patients, reviewed for mitotic activity, KI67 score necrosis and came up with some cutoffs and basically defined high-grade MTCs, at uh, least one of the following, a mitotic index more than 5 per 2 millimetres squared, KI67 greater than 5% or the presence of tumor necrosis. 
and showed that it was uh, separated out these two groups quite well. So they're proposing this as a new grading system. And again, I hesitate to present this to a international NETS expert, but there you go. So we'll move on to the next one before you make a comment. Or you can. <laughs> You're the boss. <laughs> this podcast. Check, check for RET. But anyway, go ahead. RET mutation. Yeah. And the other one was a, a review. So anyone who's involved in trials with immunotherapy, so let's face it, that's pretty much anyone who's doing trials in medical oncology now. I've found this interesting review in Nature Review, Hans, the enhancing immunotherapy in cancer by targeting emerging immunomodulatory Gelatory. pathways. Modulatory, <laughs> yeah. Basically review about, well, we know about immune checkpoint inhibitors, CTLA-4, pd or one pd or one So this is basically looking at some of the other molecules in the pathway that either stimulate or inhibit the immune system. So talking about LAG-3, TIM-3, TIGIT, BTLA, and ID-01, and a whole lot of other aspects. And so... These agents targeting these molecules are now coming into clinical trials. And I just found this a very interesting review of this field. So for those people involved in immunotherapy trials, I think this is worth referring to and having a read of. Hans is nodding. You know this paper, Hans? Sorry, what was your question? I fell asleep. You, oh. <laughs> you were nodding, so <laughs> He <laughs> was falling. That was just uh, <laughs> <laughs> falling asleep. Uh, 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 now, uh, now, boy, settle uh, down. <laughs> Fantastic. Always good having good reviews pointed out because yeah. there's lots of reviews that come all the time. Thank you, Craig. Okay. Eva, do you have any quick bites? I do, I do. Recent publication in JAMA Oncology, Uptake and Survival Outcomes Following Immune Checkpoint Inhibitor Therapy Among Trial Ineligible Patients with Advanced Solid Cancer. So this is real-world data, and you'll be aware at the at Astro they had this huge debate, is a clinical trials or real-world data more important? Now, I don't want to pay out radiation oncology, but I think that if you had it done at ASCO with medical oncologists, the clinical trials would have won out, right? But not at that. But there's a place for both. And so this is real-world data, community oncologists, people who wouldn't have got on a immunotherapy trial. And what they actually showed was they couldn't replicate the immunotherapy benefit for the for the ineligible patients. They didn't see the survival advantage over non-immunotherapy. But very interestingly, in this group of patients, the immunotherapy monotherapy showed evidence of early harm but late benefit. And remember, we always see those curves crossing whenever we see an immunotherapy versus chemotherapy, and maybe they're the sort of ECOG-2 snuck to to ones just borderline that this group represents. Then I have a trendy topic because it was published in Lancet Digital Health. Now, do you read that one, Hans? No, I don't. Very cool. So, you know, this is entitled The Use of a Next Generation Sequencing Derived Machine Learning Risk Prediction Model called the Oncocast MPM for malignant pleural mesothelioma. So they basically took a bunch of 194 patients with mesothelioma at Memorial Sloan Kettering who had been enrolled on their IMPACT trial, which is their molecular profiling uh, study, and then they took 74 patients from the TCGA database and they put them through this machine learning model and basically the model gave a better, was able to differentiate low and high risk much more than standard clinico-pathological features. And so they're saying that, you know, this is a new opportunity to risk stratify that's useful for, say, clinical trials and drug development. 
So we're talking about making progress in adjuvant therapy and we're talking about all the people who we treat unnecessarily. Maybe we can use these sort of machine learning AIs to better stratify. So that's that's the future. And very quickly, because you wave the neuroendocrine flag, I also have a neuroendocrine one. This is uh, published in the ENETS journal, which is the Journal of Neuroendocrinology, Synoptic Reporting of Echocardiography in Carcinoid Heart to get Disease. It's the ENETS Carcinoid Heart Disease Task Force. So if you have a patient with neuroendocrine tumour having echoes, if they've got a functional syndrome, carcinoid syndrome, please ask your cardiologist to report using synoptic reporting and the blueprint is there. Now, who wants to hear my amazing article of the week? Yes, please. Okay. I'm very curious to hear what it is. Okay, this is it. I love it. It's probably my favorite one I've ever done. It was published in The Oncologist. It's a subject dear to my heart, that's why. Okay, it's published in The Oncologist and it's called Does Scalp Cooling Have the Same Efficacy in Black Patients Receiving Chemotherapy for Breast Cancer? So they basically looked at the Paxman Scalp Cooling which is FDA approved to prevent chemotherapy induced mm-hmm. alopecia and the studies of the have shown a 50 to 80% success rate and high patient satisfaction but it's never actually been studied in black patients so this study looked at 15 was supposed to look at 30 patients closed at 15 because of lack of efficacy So in only one patient was it successful in preventing significant hair loss and all the others it didn't work. So it's not so much about being black. It's about having black hair or big hair. That's why I love this. And, you know, it really shows, I think, shows a lot of things. We tested something like this in just one part of the population, one ethno-cultural group and there was no requirement to test it in other groups and you know look hands it would probably work quite well for you because you're a little bit thin on top sorry to (laughs) to say (laughs) Craig's Craig wins in that but you know and this reminds me of a bit of a, a an irrelevant anecdote, but on Twitter, uh, we love Twitter, don't we? There are a whole lot of female black surgeons complaining that they can't fit their hair in the surgical caps because surgical caps are made for the sort of hair that white men have, not even women and certainly not black women with uh, big afro. So hair, my favourite subject. What do you reckon? We are uh, speechless. Did you like that one? It's an amazing article. Yes, it is. But it just goes to show, like you say, we do need studies in heterogeneous populations and not apply principles to one to the other in that. And, of course, Hans, I understand that you interviewed Jeremy Shapiro for the paper that changed your practice. Oh, I can't wait to hear this. So I'm very pleased to have you with me, Professor Jeremy Shapiro. He's an Australian oncologist. I think he works now in the Cabrini Hospital. Is that correct, Jeremy? That's correct, yes. And he's uh, specialized, I think, in GI, and if I'm not mistaken, also GU, which is a bit, for me, a weird combination because in Belgium nobody does those two together. Is it the same in Australia or is it a common combination? No, it isn't uh, that uncommon, but it's terrible at the ASCO meetings because they're always on at the same time, so you have to pick one and then be on Twitter for the other one. Or you stay in San Francisco for a long time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. So I will discuss with him today uh, the paper that changed my practice. And I think, uh, Jeremy, you chose a very old paper. I've never read it, so I don't know if I was even already on training at the moment that it came out. You may not have even been born. Look, this was a very seminal paper for me. I have to say it was published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology in 1989. And I was shown this paper 
when I was an oncology resident in the early 1990s by um, Professor Graham Brody, who was my first oncology uh, mentor and teacher. And it made a big impact, and it made a big impact for two reasons. And the first was because of the co-author was Ian Tannick. And Ian Tannick is my superhero in oncology. And, you know, for those who do GU oncology, they'll know about Professor Ian Tannick from Princess Margaret, of course. He's now retired, although he's still teaching. But he was a very famous GU oncologist who pioneered a lot of treatments in not only prostate cancer, but he had this amazing ability to distill very complicated issues and have them very rationally and easily explained. He ignored the hype and he was a voice of reason. When you had all these American zealots saying they were going to cure cancer, he would just say, hang on a minute. And the other thing he was very big on was clinical trial design. And this paper uh, was all about how you should look at clinical trials and don't just accept the data, but actually interpret the data. And so Joseph Barr and Ian, as a senior author, uh, decided to make up a clinical trial. You wouldn't get this in JCO these days, but they made up a clinical trial. They had 53 patients on their fictitious trial. It was for patients who had metastatic cancer of the great toe, and they all got multi-agent chemotherapy, which they called Kaboom. So they had Kaboom chemotherapy, 53 patients, and they presented two analyses. And the first one was how to do it badly. And you can read through it in the paper if you like. But basically, uh, what they reported was a 40% response rate. They said moderate toxicity. And they said this should be not only the new standard of care, but in adjuvant treatment of resected big toe cancer, you should use this as well. And then they presented the same data in a, a brief report about how you should present clinical trials correctly. And so what they did in the second paper is they gave you a lot more detail about the inclusion and the exclusion. They did not exclude patients who did not get to one or two therapies. They did not exclude people with non-measurable disease. They used appropriate historical controls. And at the end of the day, in the second paper, they said, listen, the response rate's only 16%. The toxicity is actually pretty bad compared to historical controls uh, that are appropriately balanced and for this subgroup. Uh, it really didn't do any good. And not only that, we've done a quality of life analysis and the quality of life was terrible, the costs were expensive, and you should not be looking at this new Kaboom regimen. And then they uh, spend a little bit of time saying, well, what was different between the two analyses of what was fundamentally the same paper and the same data? And, and what it taught me was that you shouldn't just listen and accept what you're hearing. And I was a junior oncology resident at the time, and I thought that anything that anyone presented or anything that anyone published was true. Um, but what it taught me is, no, 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 you've got to look and think about the data. Uh, you have to uh, listen to it. What's missing? What are they not saying? Are the conclusions appropriate? And so coming at a very early stage in my career, this sort of push on this paper to really think about what you're hearing rather than just accept it, was really sort of a launch of my career in research. And so it really did change the way I viewed oncology research. And I think it's still a topic which is really relevant today as well, because I also have the feeling even in very high impact papers, without pronouncing the name, but I would say it, New England Journal of Medicine, that sometimes you still see that there are conclusions made that yeah, I would not completely agree with. And although it had a statistical review by, I think, professional statisticians, you still see something that interpretation is not always. So I think it's it might be a paper that we should advise every oncologist or oncologist in training to read. And actually, I've, I've met Ian Tannock once, but I was still a student and I've seen him then in Leuven. He visited the lab and I was really impressed indeed how he could explain complex things on an easy way. But yeah, he's a real hero of mine and many uh, GU oncologists. But just this concept of, hang on a minute, stop and think. Um, and just because we've got a phase two trial of a single agent, single arm study showing a 70% response rate, it doesn't mean that the phase three subsequently will also do that and often doesn't, as you know. Uh, we shouldn't dismiss the data, but we should question it. And I think that's very valid advice. Now, the standards of clinical trial design and practice are much better now. There is no doubt about it. 
and you read this and there's some historical interest uh, really looking at how how poorly the even the best paper is written compared to how we would do it now. But it doesn't mean that we can't still think before we pronounce. Don't drink the Kool-Aid too quickly. Okay, with these wise words, we'll end the discussion. Okay, thank you, Jeremy, for passing by for the OJC paper that changed my practice. Thanks. No worries. Thank you. Great. Well, well done, Jeremy. And anyone else who'd like to present the paper that changed their practice or their life or changed their hairstyle or something, get in contact with us. But that's it for now. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, Hans. We absolutely love your papers. Thanks, Eva. And thank you, Associate Professor Craig Underhill. I just think your commentaries become so much better since your promotion. So, yeah, I fully agree. <laughs> I'm actually a bit more careful in what I say. <laughs> thank you, Rach. Thanks, Graham. See you next time on OJC. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, listeners. You've been listening to the Oncology Podcast. If you enjoyed today's edition and would like to subscribe, head over to our website, oncologynews.com.au, and sign up to our newsletter. Thanks for listening.